Thank you everyone for joining us for Sustainable Choices for Your Yard. Our panelists tonight are super excited to tell you about caring for your yard in an environmentally friendly way. Um, I will introduce them now. We're joined by Christy Truitt from the Glen Ellen Environmental Commission. We are also joined by Jan Roll and Jim Kleinwachter from the Conservation Foundation. Jan is the DuPage County Program Director and Jim is the Conservation at Home Program Manager. We will leave 10 minutes at the end of the program. If you have any questions, you can use the chat box for that. Um, Christy, if you wanna take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Brenna. And um, on behalf of the Glen Ellen Environmental Commission, we want to say thank you for the Glen Ellen Public Library for sponsoring this talk. This is um, a continuation of a series of green gatherings, as the Environmental Commission is um, dubbing them, uh, which brings different topics um, of education to Glen Ellen residents. And this specific focus as we're heading into spring is on landscaping or a term um, called greenscaping, which is taking landscaping and making greener choices for how you do yard maintenance. And um, we're very excited that the Conservation Foundation has been a part of um, this educational program, not only today, but a series of talks and events that will be kicking off tonight and continuing throughout the summer um, together. So we're very excited about this partnership with the Conservation Foundation. And we really hope that um, some of these recommendations will be very actionable for people to take home and can make small changes or big changes in their yards. And that's what we loved about this program with the Conservation Foundation is you can start wherever you are, whether your yard is mostly grass today, or if you've already adopted many native plant plants or plants that support birds and pollinators, you can take the next step with some of the recommendations, recommendations that you'll see tonight. So I really wanted to say, thank Jim and Jan for coming and talking with us. We're really excited to hear them. Again, thanks to the library for not only hosting tonight, but being willing to post this um, for, for ongoing viewing for those who can't join us tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jim now. And um, again, thanks again for your participation. Thank you, Christy. And uh, the Conservation Foundation has been around for almost 50 years. Our main office is in Naperville on uh, Knock Knowles Road. And the farm dates back to the 1870s. So you think it's old but we've updated it with all these green infrastructure things. So the solar panels, wind turbines, prairies, we have two different rainwater harvesting systems, uh, green roof. So you can see all the history and you can also see the new green things there. So there's all kinds of native plants for you to see and we welcome anybody from town coming. Maybe that would be something that uh, Glen Ellen would wanna do is organize a outing for anybody that wanted to come down and visit the farm and get a tour. So the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing is because if we want Glen Ellen to be a nice community, look at the second line, 95% private property across the state. So we can't think that the forest preserves are gonna take care of everything themselves. And in this book by Stephen Keller, he, in this quote, he talks about, we're not gonna be healthy and fulfilled if we're alienated from the environment in which we involve. So me hiking on the Appalachian Trail or guiding my son to his first muskie, you think about the things that we've done in our lives. My daughter's dancing in the Mediterranean at two o'clock in the morning, my son and his best friend, or your garden club people. You wanna be outside, you love nature. It isn't that I'm a nature guy talking to you tonight. We're all nature people inside. We love our pets, we love our gardening, we love our yards. And where do we go on vacation? We go, we fly off. I went to the to Florida and played in the Gulf of Mexico or um, people go to Yellowstone or they go to the, these um, places in the away from humans to get back to nature. So that's what we're trying to do is bring a little of that nature back into your life. We work with eight different organizations so that we're able to bring the Conservation at Home program across the whole northeastern part of uh, the state into Michigan and also into Wisconsin. And it's simple things. The reason it's caught on is we're not asking you for a lot. We can help you with water problems. We can help you improve your soil, attract wildlife, um, 
the, the plants live longer. So people that tell me they have a brown thumb, they can't grow anything. That's not true when you grow the right things. And picking better and diverse tree selections. How do we keep our trees healthy? These dots represent places across the area. It's hard to see individual dots, but we have dozens of them right in Glen Ellen. And this is one of uh, Renee, it's front yard. Um, and she doesn't have grass in the front yard and people love it. So we don't say that you have to go this far, but if you did go this far, you can be successful with it. I teach at COD about how to landscape and still keep it attractive. You want it pretty, but you can also have the beauty at the same time. With, if it's non-residential properties, we do it with conservation at work. And this is just a small sample of the places we've done it with park districts, um, corporate places, colleges, you name it. And it, it's about creating sustainable landscapes that are also productive. In this picture on the left, we're growing bee balm minarda right next to this pear tree. And the bees come for the minarda and then they can pollinate the pear. Over here, we've got swamp milkweed growing in the wet area, and then the tomatoes and other vegetables get pollinated by the attraction. So it's a win-win situation to have flowers near your vegetables. And these simple things, just thinking eco-friendly is all we're asking. So uh, less chemicals, less grass perhaps, better soil, better trees. So what ours starts with is plants. We have to understand that this is a plant-based planet, that there are no life, there is no life on this planet except for when plants evolved. So the plants create food by photosynthesis. They're the only thing that can turn sunlight into food and the whole ecosystem functions from that. So we have to understand that plants are not just a decorative thing, they are the life force of the planet. And then the next step would be that it pays, it makes a difference what type of plants you put. So for this hummingbird, he's looking at your yard as, is there anything there for me? They're not coming for a cup of coffee or conversation. They're coming for food. And we either have things for them or not. In this picture, we're solving a problem. So between the sidewalk and the parking lot, this area was so hot and dry that they said nothing would grow. And this prairie drop seed and this orange milkweed are a perfect solution. They're dry living plants that grow in these harsh environments. And there are plants that grow on the bottom of the lake to the top of the mountain. So we can certainly find things that would be appropriate for any part of your yard. And it, the key here is evolution. So we understand the turtle has a shell and it's evolved to protect itself when it needs to. A giraffe has this long neck and can eat the acacia leaves, but we don't see evolution in the plants. They put their deep roots below ground. On the left is turf grass right here. And because you can't see it, you don't appreciate the evolution. So when I'm teaching about plants, telling them, I say, this is better. Why is it better? It's because it's from Illinois. Right now you've chosen to buy a house and to invest in property in Illinois. And why aren't we embracing the plants of Illinois? If you move to, say, Arizona, you're going to be embracing cactus and succulents because it's a desert environment. Here we have a prairie. And you look at the root systems, it's pretty easy to see how, um, how big they are. If the area hey, was- Jim. Sorry, yeah. we have someone in the Q&A is mentioning that the banging is a little bit distracting. I think Jim said that it might be his dogs. I think he might be. Got it again. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Sorry about that. So in some of these areas that were low land, we can plant in that low area. And then that ditch becomes a swale, a bio swale. And we have places for the rabbit to hide or a snake. And it, um, the flowers are gonna bloom in this area that would be very difficult to mow anyway. So a lot of people might have a ditch out in front of the yard and these um, wet areas can be 
the highest um, beauty of your yard, perhaps. They're self-watering because of the rain will go to the low spot. And it's easy for me to focus on birds because everybody likes the birds. In the recent bird count, 50% of the birds were in these four species. These are really not what you want. What you want are these, and these are the native birds. And this grouping will come to take seeds and, um, but their main food is going to be bugs. And the bugs are on the plants of Illinois. Even the hummingbird on the bottom here, he'll come and take a sip of sugar water, but that's similar to me drinking a Pepsi. It gives a boost of energy, but it's not sustainable. They need protein and they get protein from the bugs. So this group will come to your bird feeder. This group will not come to the bird feeder. They're hundred percent bugs. And some of them will switch to berries in the, in the summer. So if you want the cedar waxwing, for example, then you put in a viburnum or a service berry native shrub and they will come for the berries. So this indigo bunting will eat berries, uh, the oriole and tanager, the bluebirds are strictly bugs and the kingbird. And the, even this little wren that you want him to come, you put up a wren house, but we don't understand that they eat bugs and they cannot get bugs from the turf grass. And we all love butterflies. So I talk a lot about butterflies. We make a butterfly garden at a school or a library, but the pollinators are really the bees. But everybody wants to talk about the butterflies and we make a pollinator garden or we make a butterfly garden, the bees come along for the ride underneath the radar. And so I talk about birds and butterflies just because that's the popular thing. Nobody wants to talk about snakes or skunks, but it all works when we create these diverse habitats. And, and they can be pretty at the same time. This is blazing star we're looking at here. Very attractive plant. And unlike the butterfly bush, this is native. And a lot of the, uh, both bees and butterflies can get nectar from this plant. And there are versions of this plant that grow in a wet area, a dry area, partially shaded. So they're very adaptable to a variety of different conditions in the yard. Bookweed's another one. And this one we planted right in Lyle right by the train station and the police station. And here's the larva. So these monarchs are on their way here now from Mexico and they're looking for milkweed. Here, my granddaughter, downtown Chicago, they found a milkweed growing in a crack of a sidewalk and she was able to um, find this monarch larva right in downtown Chicago. So the amazing thing about kids and connectivity to nature, and especially in urban environments, why can't we introduce and have these things available so kids can learn and grow and understand that it doesn't have to be habitat for just people. We can live together in harmony. And with milkweed, you probably know the common milkweed and it gets tall and gawky and people wouldn't want it in their yard perhaps, but this is the butterfly milkweed very pretty it's only knee high it loves it dry so if you have a dry area you put in this one there's another one for wet areas and so we can implement these things very easily into our yards and when we see i'm trying to train your eye a little bit to see areas that are not functioning well so what would we do with this this is downtown naperville and we were able to transition it into a butterfly garden so we're trying to create an idea where people can go in. It's not, you know, stay out of this natural area. And this is that prairie drop seed on the edges and cone flowers. And we plant things in clumps so they look organized and pretty. And we can get away with um, the looking nice as well as providing this ecological function. So what do we do? How do we do it on a home yard? So this yard, had problems with water. The water drained out here and came onto the sidewalk. They have no birds, they have no butterflies and their landscape does not function at all. So we got rid of the old plantings, the water that was pouring out of these downspouts here, 
we lowered the area to where we want the water to go. And then the sidewalks are not the lowest point anymore. And the water goes over here to these water loving plants. We created a def um, defined edge here with the grass. And we planted in the native plantings. They have less mowing, the birds and butterflies come back, the water problem is solved, win-win. So it doesn't matter if it's hot or dry, um, we're looking to have people put less chemicals, reduce the amount of grass, put in these hardy perennials that feed bugs and birds, use their rain effectively in their yard and get their yard functioning properly. A lot of what's in the yard now, all you have to do is Google what some plant is and you can find out where it came from. If it came from somewhere other than here, then it's not engaged in the environmental um, function of this area. So it's not functioning in the ecosystem. So our bugs don't recognize it, don't use it. And even th nice things like lilacs, very pretty, beautiful smell, bees don't use them. So I'm not saying don't have any of these in your yard, but on the other hand, they're not um, functioning as well as some other things could be. So they're not absorbing all the water in the spring. They're not feeding the birds and butterflies. So if we use them, we have to think of them as decorative things, not functioning side. And inside the house, we understand we need the functioning things. We want the microwave the TV, the stove and refrigerator, those functioning things we need, and then you decorate around them. And we need to do the same thing in our yards. So I show people the pretty plants that we can put in the yards and we're not sacrificing beauty for the function. We've been doing things like creating these pond edges and the geese we've attracted. So it's not an accident that we have all these geese and in these areas where there's a monoculture of grass, we've got a monoculture of birds using these areas. And this isn't even a nice place for people to put a blanket down and have a picnic because you know it's been treated with chemicals. There's no dandelions and there's goose poop all over. So why can't we change what's been happening with our landscapes and create diverse landscapes that are functioning again? So when the geese are gone, they're afraid of coyotes, so they will not walk through this. And we have herons and we have frogs and crayfish and there's better fishing here because of the um, diversity of um, food sources for bass, for example. We've been doing the wrong things with our yard, pouring high nitrogen fertilizer on our yards. And we all know that the soil is poor to begin with and then we put these shallow rooted plants on it and it doesn't work we're covering the united states the green is states that are covered with grass more than any other surface and we spent last year 40 billion dollars on grass care 20 million acres of an unproductive um, crop that we can't feed the poor with it's not making broccoli and we're mowing it and taking care of it and um and for what so if I showed you pictures left or right, which one's prettier? Which one is more diverse? Which one is blooming in the middle of a drought? That orange is milkweed right here for the monarchs. And the coneflowers provide food for finches. And yet, what are we covering the United States with in our neighborhoods and so on? Does it make a lot of sense? So there are things like this pollinator mix that we came up with that we can use on large areas. We did it at our farm. We have, this is 25 feet wide by 1400 lineal feet of meadow. We've sold it to the tollway and along these highways where we're gonna create habitat and reduce cost by 50%. We work with park districts on implementing meadows and short grass prairies in areas where we're not using them for ball fields. And we do a lot of education about trees. We've been over planting the wrong trees, maple, box elder, honey locust, way over planted. We had too many ash, we had too many elm and see what happened with that many of one kind. If something happens to them, disease or bugs, they 
we have a crash. And so we're promoting a variety of trees that protect us from problems. And in the shade, I've been walking properties lately and looking at the beautiful things that grow in the shade. So when people tell me nothing will grow in my shade, the trillium I saw today growing, it was like a weed in this yard, growing everywhere underneath these oaks. It was just magnificent. And water is another problem that you're seeing in the yard. We've, we're draining the water into our creeks and rivers and causing flooding problems. And it's called runoff. And after a quarter inch rain, you're getting movement across the grass surfaces and dumping it in and carrying a lot of material um, pollution with the water that's moved. And this isn't the bad part, it's the other side of the pipes. And even in our yards, there's things we could do to mitigate some of that runoff. So the house is up high, the water is gonna pitch this way. But by having plantings on the outside, we can absorb some of that water and the pollutants that might be on it from the grass. So these drain heads we have in our yards, we can plant around those two and absorb as much water as we can because the other side of the pipe is the problem area. So we can help you with these things and maybe as easy as converting, like here we're gonna be building a rain garden. So we're taking downspout water into this low spot. The rocks behind me are gonna be put over these rubber mats and direct the water into this area and then we plant in the wet area and create these rain gardens. We don't have to mow that. And the viburnums cover the air conditioner that you see there on the left. And there's, this is penstemon, very attractive to hummingbirds and spiderwort and the prairie drop seed again. So whether it be implementation of rain barrels, we sell those rain gardens, creating these butterfly gardens. The Conservation at Home program covers it all. We can come to your house for free. We Ultimately, we'd like everybody to join the program and get involved with things. We have plant sales and outings and we are trading plants and swapping things out. We have a lot of fun with the people that are connected, but there is no obligation to join anything or pay anything. We're just working with communities now to try to get all of that done. And my program was focused on the birds and butterflies and why it's better for your yard and your um, and the wildlife. And then Jan is gonna pick up from there and talk about why it's better for us and how we could implement some of these things from existing landscapes. So thank you. take it away. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh... Oh yeah, you want to stop continue. So I need to, it's, Jim, you got to click, there you go. And I'll start screen sharing and there we are, share. Okay, from beginning, come on, there we go. Okay, thanks Jim. Um, and I'm gonna pick up with um, our Nature RX program and also um, move this window away. I don't know how to do that. Uh, I don't know how to move that. Uh, yes, maybe. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna start this video. Do you find yourself longing for the apocalypse? I did. I was looking for a reason to live. Hi. Are you feeling tired, irritable, stressed out? Well, you might consider nature. From the people that brought you getting outside comes prescription strength nature non-harmful medication shown to relieve the crippling symptoms of modern life. Nature is recommended for humans of all ages, and it's great for pets too. Nature can reduce cynicism, meaninglessness, anal retentiveness, and murderous rage. In clinical studies, nature is proven to decrease work-induced catatonia. Caution, nature may cause you to slow down, quit your job, or seriously consider what the f you're doing with your life. If you are overly cynical, jaded, or emotionally numb, you may need to increase your dose of nature. Do you have trouble being even mildly uncomfortable? Nature may not be right for you. Side effects may include spontaneous euphoria, taking yourself less seriously, and being in a good mood for no apparent reason. So ask your doctor if nature is right for you. 
So I sort of wanted to set the tone there and uh, show you something a little bit that's a little bit funny and, and get started on our nature RX and what's going on. So, um, so Jim talked about programs you can get involved with at home or come visit the Conservation Foundation. And I'm going to talk about uh, why it's important to get out in nature and also um, our garden refresh program that we're working on right now. We're redoing the gardens at our office. And so you may wonder why a conservation organization is interested in uh, health. Well, part of our mission statement says that um, we are, our mission is to protect uh, open space and provide programming and protect the waterways for the health in, uh, of our communities, for the health and benefit of our communities. And open space is such an important component of feeling better and uh, it's actually, it contributes to a, a better way of life. Um, so our mind, so nature is important because our mind and body uh, need to recharge. Uh, our bodies were meant to move. So right now, it's not officially, officially a disease, but there's the sitting disease. It's actually sometimes they say more detrimental to be seated for a long time. And if you're like me, you're in front of your computer most days uh, working. And on average, everyone spends about 12 hours between driving, working, sitting at your computer. And they're finding that uh, it's the fourth leading cause of mor uh, mortality or morbidity. Um, it contributes to weight gain, high blood pressure, diabetes. And um, I don't know about you, but when I grew up, I was what they call a free range kid. I always was climbing trees, uh, playing the creek with my friends. And, and back in the 60s when I grew up, they say about on average, children spent about 70% of their time outdoors. Now, children spend about only 26% of their time outdoors. They're bombarded with information, uh, information, and they're always on their computers. And right now, unfortunately, because of school and the conditions, many students are still are on the computer. And also our phones. Our phones allow us to stay connected, you know, 24-7. And, you know, we need to get away from that a little bit. And, and part of the problem too is, you know, doctors are seeing more and more children with weight issues. Uh, they're developing high blood pressure, type two diabetes. And I went to a meeting with that forward, which fights childhood obesity. And the doctors are saying they're seeing children at the age, between the ages of two and four that are, are obese. And they're actually have, developing type two diabetes, which contributes to that, the weight gain. And one in seven children in DuPage County are now considered obese. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of times if you're overweight as a child, it continues on into adulthood. And the other, you know, concern is that right now over half our population uh, live in urban areas. Over 86% of the population in the world live there. And, and I know if, if you're like me, you're always busy. It's hard to get out in nature, but it is actually, you should consider it part of your health program to get out in nature. And, um, you know, children that live in, you know, and cities without access to green space, they actually have a lower life expectancy. Now, like I said, we were meant to move. We were hunters and gatherers of food and for shelter. And it's so important to be green um, and touch plants. Uh, in a recent article, uh, a book I read, it was uh, Your Brain on Nature, and they're talking about uh, the importance in order to care about nature Children need to connect with nature at a young age. So you need to touch nature. You need to get outside and engage and actually handle soil. I'll mention this later on too. They found in a study that if, when children handled pots and they're planting plants and then those that actually worked with the dirt were happier. And part of it, they've done a study and they found that in the soil, there's actually a bacteria. It's called uh, Mycobacterium vasii. And the substance actually affects the neurons in your brain and it acts like Prozac. And Prozac is a, 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 a stimulant or ser it, it stimulates the serotonin in your, your brain and it makes you feel relaxed and happier. So it's so important to get out in nature and touch it. As I meant, so in research shows that, you know, less, as I mentioned, less contact at a younger age also appears to remove a layer of protection against psychological issues and the opportunity for cognitive rejuvenation, uh, your brain needs to rest, basically. You know, you need to get out in nature, take a break from all the stress and all the activity that's going on out there. So, and 
also the other reason that it's important is without relief from this constant stress, you know, your brain's on hot, you know, on alert all the time. And people actually develop psychological care, you know, issues. So going back to why we need nature, the E.O. Wilson uh, in a book called Biophilia by the same name, he, biophilia is actually is a love of nature and living things and it is actually an essential part of the human nature. It's man's affinity towards nature. And it's actually in our genetic code. They did a study of infants and they were showing pictures and these are you know, babies, they put the monitors on their head and they just were flashing pictures by and they had pictures of spiders and snakes and it actually had a reaction they, you know, when they had, when they had them hooked up, it's uh, the amygdala in the brain, which is our fear center, actually triggered. And so it's in our nature. We automatically react to certain things in nature. And, you know, it's the way we are. Um, and so the other thing is when we, um, you know, as I mentioned, nature is not another, is another name for health. We really need to think of a wellness program and part of that wellness program is getting out in nature. So that's why we have the conservation at home and you don't need to go to a park or a forest preserve, get in your backyard. That's what we like about the conservation at home program. Bring nature to your backyard, bring the butterflies there, bring the birds. Uh, this past year when we've been home, my husband and I were in the backyard in the afternoon, we're working, I had my computer set up out there and he's like, I've never seen so many butterflies. And I'm like, well, we've never been in our backyard in the afternoon. And it's just, you know, it's really nice to get outside and relax. And there's also the study, you know, the other importance of getting out in nature, there's a study by the University of Michigan, and they found just a 15 minute stroll in the woods gives us positive emotions. It's like your brain taking a nap. So like in the work day, just get outside for a little bit, breathe in the fresh air. When my kids ever, whenever my kids felt sick, I'm like, just go outside, you'll feel better. And you know, it just makes you feel better getting outside. And as I mentioned, you know, the, oh, here, yeah, so the stress, and actually, when I was talking about the break, it also reduces your stress levels, anxiety, and actually helps you, um, you know, interact, you need to put, take away your phone when you go outside, and you need to just relax. Uh, they found that when you're on a phone outside in nature, you don't get a break, you aren't getting relaxed. They did a study, and they had people, one group was on a phone, and they told them to take your phone and go out and walk an arboretum, and the other group didn't. And the group that had their phone, they said it was as if they didn't even get out in nature. The group that didn't have their phone, they could recall more things, they saw more things. And when you get out there, also you need to engage all your sensors, senses. Uh, we have a program, we have a forest therapy guide that we take people outside in the summer. And they sort of teach you how to interact with nature. I know it seems like, okay, I should know how to do that. but you, you, you smell things, you smell things, you, know, you listen and smell the fresh leaves and you look at closely at the ground, you actually study certain areas and you see movement of insects and other things that you really weren't paying attention to. You know, we need to get out for exercise, but also you need to take in what's around you, feel the wind on your face and absorb what's around you. And as I mentioned, mentioned the, you know, the stress part of our brain here, I'm showing, is in the frontal, uh, frontal cortex here of your brain, prefrontal cortex, it's where the cortisol is and that causes stress. So this is a brain basically on stress. You can see there's a gap here. They sort of measured the gap. And over here, it's lessened. When, this is when the brain is actually relaxed. And this is just showing stress. So when they found that when you go out in nature, forest therapy is really beneficial um, to your stress levels, as I mentioned, and it's an antidepressant they found. And they also found that on forest bathing trips, you can actually boost your white blood cells that fight viruses and tumors. So as I mentioned, gain, you know, engage all of your senses and go outside and relax. And part of this program or how it actually got started was in Japan. They have a program, and, and I don't know, usually I have an audience and I raise your hand, have you heard of this? It's called Shinrin Yoku, and it's forest bathing. And uh, at the Nippon Medical School, researchers found that spending time in the woods strengthens our immune system. And when I mentioned the white blood cell increase in the white blood cells to fight uh, infection, they found that the plants give off a volatile organic compound called photo photonsides. 
And these plants, when they give them off, as we breathe these in, they have the antibacterial, antifungal qualities that are natural uh, disease fighters. And they, these are what boost our white blood cells. And they're doing more and more study, research on this. And they, what's interesting in a particular smell they found that, it, that is very beneficial is cedar. And if you think about it, uh, back in the time when there was TB and the TB hospital, in Germany, they put a lot of their TB hospitals in the forest so the patients could go outside and walk. And, you know, they were onto something back then that, you know, we didn't even think of, you know, we're learning more about now. And there's more and more research going into the benefits of nature. Uh, Dr. Robert Ulrich did a study of students. He showed them in his class, he showed them a film that was very distressful. And then he actually sent one group of students, so after, and they tested their, you know, their blood pressure and all this other stuff, and they had to do them a test afterwards. So one group was sent to the city, and the other group was sent out into a park. And again, I usually ask how many people, you know, where do you think they did better? Well, the students that actually went out to the parks felt better, they felt friendlier, happier, they had lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, um, and the, the students that actually went out in the cities felt sad, aggressive, and angry. And another study he also did was in hospitals. He had patients uh, in a hospital, and there was a hospital that had two wings, and it worked out really well because uh, they were all gallbladder patients, and they had the records. And the one side, the patients just had a wall to look at, no windows of nature. And the other side had natural scenes to look at. And he found that the patients that looked out on leafy, here, green, leafy trees on average had fewer complications. They had less long of a stay. They needed significantly less pain medication. And they contribute this all to being able to look out on nature. And, you know, this is a, um, a site ever, if you ever, you know, this is a park site and how does it make you feel? You know, it makes you feel the blues and greens actually are very soothing to the eye. This is early spring, it's a beautiful, if you ever get a chance to go there, Messenger Woods or some May apple here in the front and wild geranium behind it. But they actually, the soft lines and stuff actually relax us. And when you're in a city, they say the sounds, the horns, the people, the eye, rapid eye movement actually increases your stress level. And then the sharp angles aren't soothing to the eye and it causes distress. So if you look at something like this, or would you rather look at something like this, you know, a, a nice beach scene. And if you're like me, as I mentioned, you may not have much time to go out. So how much time do you really need to be outside? You know, like I said, we're all busy, but really a study done in Finland said five hours a month on average is actually beneficial, just that little bit. So if you go out like 15 minutes a day uh, and for you know five days a week, or yeah, 15 minutes a day or 30 minutes, two times a week, you can actually, be, it can benefit you, your stress levels, your heart rate, everything else like that. So, you know, in the optimal, they said it's 10 hours, but like most of us, you don't have enough time to get outside. So like I said, you need to get outside and get dirty. Um, and that maybe there's something to that term, uh, happy gardener. And so this is what I'm gonna get into now is um, you can bring nature to your backyard and work in your yard. So we have, if you wanna work in your yard, follow us along on Facebook and in our office, we have a program, uh, Garden Refresh. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. We did a webinar on March 31st, so if you're interested, you can go to our Follow the Conservation Foundation on YouTube and find the video. And it was Nancy Sonato and myself, and we worked together and we're working with the other staff members to redesign our gardens. So this is our office. This is the Clow House. Um, it's a historic house they relocated here. And we're redoing the entrance gardens around the front and on the side. And we did it from the perspective of new gardeners. And we actually had someone in our office that we used as a guinea pig because she's never gardened, she's our accountant, um, and she's never gardened, doesn't know anything about plants, and we showed her what we were doing, and she kept asking questions like, okay, we need to make this a little less complex and stop talking about the conservation lingo that we talk. So I'm gonna just show you real quickly 
This is the left side as you walk in. This is this past winter of what it looked like. And this is the plan that uh, we worked on for the house. And I'm just gonna go through some of the plants here. So you get an idea of how pretty uh, native plants can be. So up in the left corner is a wild blue indigo we're putting in, some butterfly weed that Jim showed you earlier in the lower left with the, um, uh, in the butterfly weed. Down the low center is a grass. I love it, it's prairie drop seed. It smells, people say it smells like buttered popcorn in the fall. And it actually, to me, it smells like cilantro. Uh, up in the center is uh, uh, calamantha, uh, nepeta, lesser, and then it's, uh, there's a coreopsis, threadleaf coreopsis here in the yellow. And then there's, uh, on the right side is anise hyssop. It actually has a fragrant leaf if you crush it. And then up from the, in between the prairie drop seed, we're gonna plant this allium up in the upper right, it's in the onion family, and it'll pop up through the prairie drop seed while it's low. And then as it dies back, the foliage is not real attractive and it dies back, so it sort of hides it. So all these plants are interacting together. So this is just an idea of what we're doing on that side of the garden. And as you go around the front, you'll see this long bed, and we're repeating some of the same plants. Uh, but we also have, uh, along the building we have in the upper left is uh, New Jersey tea, and we're gonna have this purple poppy mallow or also called wine cup. And in our series, we actually give the botanical name and the common name because it's so important to use botanical name because Nancy and I were talking about the same plant. And we didn't know it because we talked about the wine cup. I called it uh, purple poppy mallow and she called it wine cup and we were talking about the same plant. Um, in the middle here is uh, purple phlox, uh, wild sweet william. And I have butterflies swarmed that this past year. Uh, the purple coneflower that Jim showed. Upper right is called Pussy Toes, and we're putting it in front of a rock that we have here. And again, we're repeating the uh, butterfly milkweed. And there's also in the lower is a shoot, uh, shooting star, and it's actually a spring ephemeral, so it's going to come up and go away again. And we're doing all conditions, so this is, gets full sun, this whole side of the house. And then the, the garden just to the right of that is of, of the entry is um, a small garden we're doing there. Again, it gets repeating and carrying over the same plants. Uh, we're gonna have a, a plant there. It's a new shrub from uh, Midwest ground, ground cover. And we also, we, we really want you to plant natives as much as possible, but sometimes you need a cultivar. And some of these are cultivars of natives. And a cultivar means it's like a hybrid. It may not be as beneficial to insects, but sometimes they still provide nectar. Um, so it's a, um, in the upper left is a, uh, I can't think of the name of it. Oh, um, proud, Proudberry Coralberry, and it's a cultivar. And then in the middle is a New England Aster, and it's, it is a purple dome, so it's more compact, doesn't get as leggy and weedy, so it's, it's a, again, a cultivar. And I'm repeating the prairie drop seed, so we carry the same thing in the shooting star in the, in the uh, purple coneflower. And then on the other side of the house is more shady, um, and it's a hill, it's dry, it's much more uh, strenuous conditions. And again, we did a planting plan for that, and we have shade loving plants in that area. Uh, we have wild geranium in the center, and we have big leaf aster, zigzag, oh, that, oh sorry, that's zigzag aster, Solomon seal. I'm going through these quickly because we're getting, running out of time. But if you really want to follow us, uh, go watch the video. And uh, these are some oak leaf hydrangea in the lower right. That is more, these are all shade loving plants, and we're putting some service berries. These are multi stem, they call understory trees, which go under larger trees. And then some more lower plants. Uh, lower left is a wild geranium, or I mean, sorry, uh, wild ginger, which I absolutely love. And it's a great ground cover if you have shady areas. Uh, the bay apples in the sort of the center it has a little white flower, and they actually get like it looks like a little apple underneath of it. Um, there's a sedge where you have some carex that we're planting in the area, and the, the red flower is a uh, columbine. And I love this spring ephemeral on the right. It's Jack in the pulpit. And it's a unique, very unique flower that comes up and it will die in spring ephemeral means it comes up in the spring while the trees don't have leaves on it. And as the trees leave out, these die down the summer when the heat comes. And the big leaf aster I mentioned is on the lower right. So here's a sample of what we talked about. We had design tips, uh, plants selected, the characteristics of the plants, preparing planting beds. And we're gonna have blogs and we're gonna have, um, and we'll be sending this stuff uh, to the village too to share. We can share some of the links so you guys can get in touch, but watering, mulching, and just follow the progress. And we do things like, this is how we're killing the grass. We put cardboard down and we put some tarp 
And I was telling Jim earlier that we just went through all this and the tarp actually underneath the grass is still really green after putting it down. We should have started earlier in the year. So if you're interested, you know, contact Jim or myself um, for our uh, conservation at home program and, and we can work together to get you certified. And if you like native plants and you wanna get some, uh, we have a plant sale coming up on May 1st and 2nd for the public. If you're a member, it's on April 30th. And don't forget, this is sort of a prelude and a kickoff to the Village of Glen Ellen, uh, the Environmental Commission, and the Glen Ellen Park District. We're having an Earth Day Symposium on Sunday, April 25th from 1 to 4. And Jim's a keynote, and we have all uh, lots of speakers here. We're talking about landscaping for birds and pollinators, natural lawn care, recycling, uh, urban forest stewardship, and then stormwater. And, and, you know, so tune in to that day. You can sign up on a Zoom link. I'm sure they have, them, um, they have them at the Park District and on the Village site. Again, my name's Jan Rail. That's my email for contact. And uh, it's time. Let me get out of this. Uh, stop share. And it's time for questions. Yes, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, let me cross that off. Sorry to speed through at the end, but I wanted to get through and have time for thank questions you. at the thank end. Thank you so much. Yeah, great job. Thank you so much, Jim and Jan. That was really thrilling. I feel like I've actually taken a walk in the forest <laughs> by watching all the slides you've that, that's, everyone, so, that's everyone's, uh, that's everyone's uh, assignment or your, your prescription to take a dose and go outside and walk in nature or get some native plants and you know, start, pla you know, start planting a yard from the plant sale. But yeah, get out in nature, walk outside. Absolutely. The next uh, three weeks or so, the wildflowers are just amazing. Maybe maybe you've got a month, but um, get out and see the bluebells and oh. and these trillium blooming. And um, so you can contact us if you don't know where to go. We definitely would tell you what forests are just amazing this time of year. Anybody that has shade, this is the time to get out and look at what um, a, a natural forest would be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like one of those things you can see it once a year and it's right now. Right. Right. It so does I, change, but this is like the peak. And so it's worth getting out um, to see those. So there's some questions coming up. Yeah. I don't know if, if you, you want me to go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You guys want to ask yeah, them I or guess, I can... yeah. Yeah, I wanted to, well, yeah, let's go through some of the questions. And I have actually a wrap up question as well um, as we go into it. So, well, I see from Jeff Garris, who's asking about the um, uh, plants, some of the plants be for sale at the plant sale you mentioned on May 1st and 2nd. So it sounds like that will be a native plant sale, right? Yes. We're, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, we have, um, we're going to have on the, we're going to have vegetables. So if anyone's interested in vegetables, Green Earth Harvest has their vegetables on sale. We also have native uh, herbaceous plants, and we're going to have native trees and native shrubs um, that whole time. And there are two different pickup dates. So when you, if you read, if you buy them, um, there are two different pickup dates for both of them. And the got to get my calendar. Well, our, the native plant sale that weekend, the pickup is going to be May 22nd, and the pickup for the veggies is May 7th and 8th, and it's by alphabetical. And ours is just a time from 8:30 to 1 on the 22nd. You'll pick up your plants after ordering. So more, so more information, it sounds like, could be found on the Conservation Foundation website, right? Definitely, so yes. And then it, you always can contact Jan or myself who can work with you on the plant. So if you can't Fantastic. feel you're not ready to order yet, don't worry. Just contact us. We'll help you. And we can still get plants throughout the year. It's just um, this is one opportunity coming yeah. up. I love that what you talked about is that these plants actually um, are productive, right? They're working, they're not just beautiful, but they're actually serving a purpose. And so it's kind of putting our front yards, our backyards, side yards um, to actually to productive work and um, be able to create, really bring our yard to life in terms of um, wildlife pollinators and things like that. Um, so, and so, uh, there's a couple of questions here in terms of are there, you know, permitting requirements in Glen Ellen specifically um, for various yard modifications. So like Marie had that question, Jody Baltimore um, has a question as well about the parkway. So um, just talking from what I understand, and we can do some more research to let everyone know, but um, in the, the Glen Ellen Parkway, um, the, the, obviously the village puts down sod and the idea there is that 
a couple of things. One, you don't want to make sure you want don't want to put tall plants there that would block um, the view of traffic. So that's an important thing. Also, the village has the, it's their right of way. So if they ever need to do any maintenance um, in the parkway, they need to feel free to disrupt that space and. Um, they make no commitments to um, repairing it or replacing it as it was, but they do make a commitment to replacing um, grass. So if there are changes you make, um, that's something you have to be aware of that, you know, they could be, um, uh, they could be lost. There is no um, warranty over those. And my understanding is that there is at least a, a uh, like a, I think it is a free permit to be able to make some changes to your parkway in Glen Ellen, but you have to do that within the guidance that you might lose those plants in time. So yeah. ground cover would be a great choice. <laughs> yeah, if we did a, when we did the garden tour in Glen Ellen uh, last year, I believe, one of the residents actually started planting and they consulted with the, the village and they also don't want plants falling over the sidewalk. So they recommended something very low again, so not block that uh, sight line when you back out or anything, but also they want something low and nothing that's gonna block the sidewalk. That's important too. The other consideration is trees, right? So basically the trees in the parkway are owned by the village of Glen Ellen, right? And so right. It's, we're, you know, we have to be stewards of those trees. There are some plants that are not native that would compete with the root structure of trees right. and just would not be a great idea. So right. again, you we have to use um, wisdom and it's great to consult with the village um, and public works in doing that. Uh, um, well, while you're answering the questions, I just want to know in, in the chat and in the response to someone on questions and answers, I put a link to our website, the TCF website, to the plant sale. So it's in the chat. If you click that link, it'll take you to our TCF plant site uh, link for the plant sale. Sorry. Great. No, that's a great question. And then uh, Jacqueline has a question about um, how to get started. So talk, yeah, I, that was actually a great one, Jacqueline, because that was going to be my uh, kind of closing out or wrap up question, but we can talk about it now is, you know, what's the best way to get started then, you know, so my, my yard that we moved in just a few years ago. And so I have a lot of grass and a few bushes, but not enough natives. <laughs> so if you're starting from zero, what's the best way, what's the part, how can you help us in terms of partnership with this conservation at home? I think the, the first thing I would offer would be, why don't we walk it together and see what you have. Mm -hmm. I can help you identify what's what. We can mm -hmm. point out good things, bad things. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I ask people to show me what you like about your yard and what areas that you don't like or do you have problems with water so by asking you a bunch of questions we can try to find something that's going to help so mm -hmm. i'm i'm all about if it's not broke don't fix it yeah. and i'm hoping that the people that call they either don't like their yard they have problems in their yard something that they're wanting to fix or make better and then i can help them implement those things so yeah. Um, simple as creating a butterfly garden or a rain garden to solve some water issues. I mean, I think with the monarchs coming here, everybody could use some milkweed. Yes. So, you know, where would I put it? What variety would I get? Mm -hmm. All those things I can help you. But um, to, I, there isn't any other group. The reason we're doing what we're doing is there isn't anybody else who will come to your yard, give you advice, not trying to sell you anything. And it's free. Yeah. That's amazing. That is actually pretty exciting. <laughs> and sometimes, like you said, it's, you can make actually make an improvement just by editing something out, right? Something that you don't want. Um, it might be one of the simple solutions, you know, to make a, allow a place space for other things to thrive. So fantastic. So um, contacting you through the Conservation Foundation and inviting you out walk the yard, make some recommendations. And I know both Jim, what you and Jan, some of the things you, um, showed in your slides were where there were actual garden designs proposed. So is that something that you work with people on as well in garden designs or um, how do you, how far do you, or the, were those like demonstration gardens you were doing? The garden design was actually, that was for our office. Yeah, okay. We, we typically don't do the designs for the residents. That was just specifically for our office. So we're gonna get volunteers to help us plant it and they need to know specifically where they're going. Yes. So we don't drop right. your design. We give you advice on what, native plants and how do you address problem areas? Sure. Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. Yeah, we go as specific to say, here's four different plants that might be good over there, but we don't necessarily tell you 
put this plant right there That's fair. you know those mm -hmm. specific things and then we work with some contractors so if you said i want a tree over there but i don't want to plant the tree mm -hmm. um or i want a, gar a garden over here but i'm not doing it yeah. then we would refer you to somebody else that actually can help implement that perfect can you also tell us a little bit about the um I, I early in the presentation there was a map right of of certified yards right and it's yeah. kind of neat to see those start to you know fill in a little bit i think we have maybe 30 to 35 in glen allen certified yards so far um, yes. which we'd love to get a higher number but can you tell us a little bit more about that and um, becoming certified what that well, means you know i think everybody could get on the path so you know today you could say you know i want to do the certification thing we've now made it easy so you can get on the website and you can join the program and then you get connected to me and we start coming over and doing those things so we have a checklist when we come out and we say you know this 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 can be done um if you aren't ready this year we come back next year and awesome. do another series you know so it's like you're on a path mm -hmm. so um i think we make it easy enough for mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and you know the even if you join it's 50 dollars like a one time mm -hmm. to join the club and awesome. um so it isn't that expensive even if you wanted to jump forward and say i definitely want to do that fantastic okay there's some questions about beginner gardeners too. And one thing I think about when I'm selecting plants, like especially native plants, is what is their natural habitat? For example, the, the black eyed Susans and the um, purple coneflower, their natural habitat is a prairie. So they're going to like dry, sunny conditions. So that's their, and the other ones are woodland plants. So the woodland plants are going to like the shadier areas, you know, and sometimes moist, sometimes dry woodland areas. So think about, you know, the location. If you find out about a plant, think about where it naturally grows. And that helps you decide where I need to put it in my yard mm -hmm. type idea. And we scan through for you. So, you know, if you looked at, there is a native guide to Illinois plants and it's about a thousand pages and there's all this material in there. You wouldn't know what to do. And you yeah. just close the book and say, I can't do this. So we, yeah. we know what's, like behind me the picture there um there are plants that are exceptionally pretty are easy to grow and we start with those we have a list we call an a-list plants this is for the beginner who this is where you start and then once you get a little further along we know that these are growing really well then we start adding in some of these odd ones there's um i've got some people that are ordering there's a native cactus and it's a prickly pear cactus. It's not, you know, it's not like the prettiest thing, but they wanted to have it. And it, you know, it's, it is a plant of Illinois. So it doesn't matter how dry it is. There are some odd plants and then there's some really ornamental ones that are just breathtaking. So the beginner starts out with the basic easy stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if Jim comes to your yard and helps you out, you know, You'll never fail. You can always, when you plant it, if it doesn't work, move it. I mean, you know, start out with something. I've, you know, it's sometimes it's, you learn from it. I've actually planted plants and, you know, all of a sudden it's, it'll come up somewhere else. Well, I found a better home than where I put it. So it ends up there. But it's a, a live and learn and there's no way, you, you can't go wrong. Just start out. You got to jump in with both feet. Have Jim come talk to you or myself. And he gives great advice for your yard and helps you out getting started. And, and just jump in and it's experiment. I mean, it's taken me you know, 25 years to get my garden to what it is now. And it just takes time. Yeah. Well, this is, um, this is really exciting. I think, again, some of the key takeaways that I heard tonight is, again, that um, we can start anywhere, we can start small, you know, even a corner can become butterfly, you know, stopover point. Um, it sounds like there's also native plants that, you know, you know, sometimes I think of prairie plants and unless I have a lot of sun in my yard, there's nothing I can do, but it sounds like there's both, you know, wet, dry, shade, sunny, um, there's solutions where we can make a transformation um, in a, a certain yard space. And then um, 
that there are also solutions to for stormwater management, which is really interesting. You know, maybe you have to take a tree out and now all of a sudden you have a water problem in your yard. What do you do? You know, plants can solve that solution near term, um, which is great. So um, thank you. And Brenda, are we, are we closing in on time? Is that where? Um, just about, I did share Jan and Jim's contact information in the chat. If anyone has a question that we didn't get to. I also wanted to plug um, the library is doing a recycling drive during the month of April. Oh, we're collecting, sure. we're partnering with Scarce, which is another environmental organization you probably are familiar with. And we are collecting crayons and bread tags. So if anyone would like to bring those into the library, we'll have boxes out at both the adult and youth desks. So thank great. you. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, so, yeah, we are out of time. Um, okay. Thank you so much for presenting this evening. And yeah, if anyone has further yeah, questions, you can contact Jan and Jim. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye.